We are live. I don't know if anybody's on. Hey, good morning, folks. Wow, that's crazy. My little indicator right there went from zero. It was hovering at zero for like a minute and a half, two minutes, and it went to 26 that fast. So that's really weird. That's actually kind of cool. It looks like um, the way this thing works is the notification goes out, or maybe you get notified by Facebook. You hear that ding and you click on the live stream or whatever else. And then before I know it, we have 46 people on the live stream. So welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Looks like there are lots of comments starting uh, up on the live stream comment area. Um, and by the way, in the post itself, I was talking about um, the Live Fire app in the last show. Some of you got on the Live Fire app and tried to use uh, the code. It's free 30 or didn't use the code. Anyways, that's how you get the 30 days access to the Live Fire app. And uh, if if you're wondering what the Live Fire app is, I'll give you just a real quick test preview of what I showed last week because I got a bunch of comments and a bunch of DMs on, hey, Mike, what was that thing that you showed last week? And this the new update, if you have Live Fire, you won't see it like this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to talk to you about a bunch of cool low light flashlight techniques. Um, this is what the Live Fire app looks like when you when you open it up, right? But the thing I showed last week was what I call the RPT, the repetitive part timer. Um, it's built into the system, and I had them build this for me. When that when I met these guys, I said, "Hey, I need this. I dry fire a bunch. I don't want to be able to. I, I love my, some. I have pack timers. I have the Commander AMG Lab timers. They're all great timers. But what I asked them to do was build me a, a timer. I'm going to put uh, let me put two seconds in here, where I could set up uh, the number of repetitions. So I'm going to go five repetitions. And I could change the reset time. So I could select the number of repetitions and the reset time on the timer itself, right? Uh, and let me go done. And then I can click start. And then lo and behold, I have the RPT. Now let me turn the volume up just a little bit for you so you can hear it. And it's also, the interesting thing about this is it's visual too. So maybe you don't want to work on an auditory, audio, audio, audit, auditory, if that's the right term, uh, stimulus, you could work on the visual as well. All right, so see how it's normally, it's it's starting, it has a part-time setup, and it has a reset time. So if you're doing a dry fire drill like these low light drills that we'll be talking about here in a second, that takes you longer to set up for the next repetition, like maybe you have to put a different mag in the gun or whatever, the RPT is the way to go. So check out Live Fire, it's at the top of that thing. You can get 30-day free trial. Anyways, that's it. By the way, when you're done with your reps, when I talk about getting your 50, It'll tell you you're done, and you can see the repetitions up here. Like you would have 50 out of 50 done. So that's when I say, hey, get your 50. That's what I'm talking about. Get your 50. Hey, good morning, folks. If you're jumping on the live stream with me, and I'm, my name is Mike C. Klenner. Of course, we're talking about low light flashlight techniques this morning. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of Q and A, and hopefully get into a lot of material. So if, you, if you're one of my members, one of my awesome coin members, throw your coin number up there. I know most of you identify with your coin number. If you're on watching and wondering what a coin number is, well, there's a link in the live stream as well. Go to AmericanWarriorsSite.com if you want to check that out. You can get your coin, get your challenge coin, and uh, find out more about the challenge coin process. Now, number two, uh, if your coin member, throw your coin number up there. Number two, if you're ACSS member, one of my competitive shooting team members, Please throw that up there on the ACSS member as well. Now, I am live on Shooting Performance, uh, American Warrior Society, and the IDPA Facebook page. So good morning, IDPA members. I hope you're doing well. hope you're doing well. And if you're an IDPA member, maybe throw that up there as well. Um, IDPA members, of course, the, today's context is more defensive-oriented, but we could talk about some competitive use of the flashlight because in reality, um, you know, it's kind of the same technique. And I'll show you the difference between a one-handed technique and a two-handed technique and what I prefer to use. Now, if you're joining me this morning, if you're doing this live stream with me this morning, number one safety rules and the safety of you and, and, and my audience is always my number one priority. So please do me a favor, make sure you have no live firearms, no loaded firearms or live ammunition in the area you're in, if you're going to dry fire. So if you're carrying your gun, if you're on duty right now, 
or you're at the gym and you have a loaded firearm in a carry bag of some sort or whatever, that's a, that's fine, but you're not going to do the dry fire drills. No weapon handling unless you comply with all safety rules. You should know the four primary safety rules. All guns are always loaded, backs up and beyond, trigger finger up, trigger until you're ready to shoot, and muzzle direction if you're not willing to comply by the uh, safety rules, please. I would hate to tell you to go somewhere else and watch some other show because that would suck. Anyways, do me a huge favor and tell me if my sound and video and everything is good to go. It looks like I got a bunch of people on and I don't have any issues about the sound. Good morning. Montana's in the house. IDPA's in the house. Hey, Diego. How are you, Diego? Let's see what else we got on here. Well, Rudy was the first one to pop up and say good morning. Good morning. John in Oklahoma. Good morning. Coin member. John in Oklahoma. Scott is on. Good morning. Freddie Gunworks is on. I was wearing your shirt the other day, by the way. Freddie Gunworks. Adrian, good morning. Good morning. Randy D, good morning. Uh, Charmaine, hello, Charmaine Don. Good morning. James Tromley in the East Coast. Good morning. Dell is on. Sandra is on. Let's see who else I have on. Scott Peters, that's outstanding. Orenda is on as well. Um, man, we got a bunch of people on. Tony's on. Ron's on. Adrian Muller's on. Jeez, haven't seen you for a while. Nice to go. Scott is on. Okay. A lot of people on. All right, folks, do me a favor. If you haven't clicked that share button, while I take a sip of my coffee, click the share button, and we will get into this morning's show. Hmm. I know some people jump on the, the posted videos on YouTube and say, man, there's so much time where you're talking to people and drinking your coffee. I'm bored with that. Here's the point. If you're watching this later on on YouTube, and you don't want to listen to me take just a moment say, to say good morning to the lovely live stream viewers or sip my coffee. I'm sorry. Go watch something else. I really don't care. Because you watching this live are the most important thing to me. I tell you, uh, I was actually thinking about this morning as I was getting ready. Uh, I really, really enjoy getting in front of the, the camera and doing this live stream. I enjoy uh, teaching something. I enjoy the interaction. So me saying good morning to you and hi and asking you to share and interacting, that, that's the whole point of a live stream. I mean, that's the that's the point of the live stream is this interaction because anybody can get on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook and watch videos. I mean, geez, we could sit there all day long and scroll on our phone and watch videos, but to have this interaction for me is key. So I truly appreciate you, the viewers of my live stream audience. Uh, maybe I'll cut this clip out and post this on Instagram and say, hey, thank you for watching. If you're on the Instagram and you're seeing this as a tip or in tip form, jump on the live stream on, on Wednesday or Thursday mornings. Trust me, you'll enjoy it and you'll get your questions answered and stuff like that. All right, folks, um, we are going to rock and roll here. My mouse is acting kind of funny. I don't know why that is. I was having some trouble with my mouse earlier. Just want to make sure I don't have any other comments. I'm going to try to track the comments. And the way this is going to work, folks, is if I'm teaching something, if I'm back from the camera, I may have a hard time seeing comments. On some of these live streams in the past, I would have Mr. Rich Brown feed me comments or sometimes Chris at IDPA. Good morning, Chris, by the way. Feed me comments. But in this case, typically, I can see the comments and I'll just read them. So let's talk about let's talk about low light uh, systems. And by the way, I'm going to have a variety of guns on this morning. These are all Wilson Combats. Uh, I got two of the SF series, which stands for solid frame. This is my new SFX9 with an optic on it. So this is probably going to be my carry gun once I run another four or 500 rounds through it. So that gun is unloaded and clear and safe. I've got another SF uh, X9. This is actually the four inch model. So this has a longer slide and longer barrel. This is unloaded and clear. And I have uh, a general EDC X9. So the EDC X9 is unloaded and clear. And the variant difference is the SF has what they call a solid frame. The EDC X9 has grip panels. Um, and actually you can switch out a bunch of things on the EDC so you can vary the hand size. They have a different hand feel. Uh, but anyways, those are the three guns I'm going to be using today. I, I actually have a surefire weapon mount of light on this sucker um, to demonstrate some some things in terms of weapon mount of lights. And um, so let's get into it. So let's, let's talk about uh, a low light system. So if you are playing with low light. And I wrote a, bu a book a long time ago. Uh, it was just a short book I actually produced after I had done a series of videos. It's called The Low Light Fight. I'm actually in the process of editing that book because, um, to put it bluntly, there's some spelling errors, some other little things that I can make better. And I'm expanding that book with a bunch of chapters. But in The Low Light Fight, I talked about the principles of a low light system. So I want to remind you what the principles of any good low light system must have. Number one, a good low light system must give you the ability 
to effectively search, right? I call that the search phase of your low light system. And understand there's a difference or a separation between your search phase and your engage phase. Your engage phase is where you're actually engaging a threat that you find in the area. Your search phase is where you're trying to safely search an area uh, as efficiently and as safely as possible. And understand this, one tip for you in terms of your search phase, I'm not telling you that you should search, right? So there's a pro tip for you. I'm telling you that if you decide to search, here are some thoughts on how you might want to do it, right? Okay. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second, because if you're in your house and you're in a safe room, a safe environment, and you can, you can lock the door or you can barricade yourself in a, in a good position and wait if you think someone is truly a threat in your house to come to you, that's a much smarter move than getting into your home and searching where you may end up in the, what I call the FUT. What's the FUT? The fouled up tangle, F-U-T, FUT. And I stole that term from a buddy of mine in Bergen. And I don't know where he got it, he got, probably got it from somewhere else. But the point is, I'm not telling you to search. So any good low light system must give you the ability to search an area, right? We'll call that the search phase. I'll talk more about that in a second. The, the, your low light system must give you the ability to defend yourself. So if, if you end up in contact distance, like close enough where I'm close to this camera, I have might have to have the ability, boom, to use some sort of combative technique or physical technique to strike at the threat or defend my head from maybe an onslaught of punches or a baseball bat. You know, and when I'm talking about defending my head we just did a, what, a, what we called a five-day fight challenge. In our five-day fight challenge, we talk about the cage position, right? This is the half cage position, right, uh, in, a, in a fight. This is the full cage position where I'm literally building a cage around my head. If you haven't seen that material, you can check that out. We'll put some links online. Uh, but the point is that cage position can be simulated with a flashlight. So if I have a flashlight and I'm searching and I end up in a situation where, boom, I'm, I'm in contact with someone. Someone is right there and they're throwing punches at my face. I need to get the arm up in front of my head. And for me, I like to make contact with my head and my arm because if I'm getting hit, the, the, the point of, of, of doing this is to protect your head. We don't want to get knocked down and we don't want to get knocked out. So if I make contact and attach my arm to my head in a variation of a half cage position, um, those punches and those blows hopefully won't turn my head as violently and I can survive that on, onslaught for a few minutes. I understand before you say it, right? If you're on watching this later on the Facebook and you're a Facebook commenter, by the way, seem to be a lot of um, seem to be a lot of rats on Facebook lately. All these expertise or all these experts that you don't really know because they don't have an actual username. But if you're watching this and go, well, Mike, you can be hit with an uppercut, right? You can be hit with something else. I know that what this is, is this is a, a transitional position for me to defend my head long enough for me to boom, shoot, right? Or boom, throw a counter strike or move. That's all it is. It's a transitional position. Now, there are a lot of good options. This option, right, where I'm bringing this elbow up to my face allows me to have my vision, right? I can use my light if I need to. And if you look at this position, I can still shoot. So this is kind of an interesting cage up position. And if you could imagine that you're the threat, and these are some subjects, by the way, that I wrote about in my book. These are some things that most people that teach low light don't ever post about or think about, these combative things. But if you think about this, if you're fighting it, that's why I call it the low light fight. If you're in a low light environment and you end up in contact distance with someone, you have to have key techniques where you can defend your head. In this particular case, notice that you can still barely see my eyes, right? So from the camera's perspective, I still have my vision, but I have the ability to use the light if I need to, okay? Uh, I also have the ability to use my elbow. So if you can imagine, if you were standing in front of me and I went from maybe a strike on you to the elbow position and I drove you into the wall with the point of my elbow, but if you'll notice, the gun is still in a position or a downward position where I can fire from it. Now, there are no perfect positions. Understand that. You know, we're, we're talking about the low light environment. There are, no, there are no perfect positions, but I play with those three positions where I, I call this a high cage, right? So I'm defending myself against probably some sort of onslaught or blows from the top. This might be a little bit lower one where I cage up in close contact where I can drive my elbow to, but I still have my vision and I still have the ability, by the way, to use the light and all these techniques. I have the ability to light and illuminate. 
And the gun is in a retracted position where I can actually utilize it, right? So the third, the second thing, man, I kind of got off track. The three things your low light system has to give you, the ability to search. I'll talk about that in a second. The ability to fight, defend. And then number three, the, the ability to shoot, right? In, in whatever position you want to utilize. I call that the one-handed eye index technique, and we'll talk about that in a second, okay? Um, I tend to get long-winded and ramble a little bit. I kind of got off track there, man. Who's joining us this morning? Good morning, Max. Charmaine. Tina. Hello, Tina. I saw you on, uh, I think, on Facebook on my post yesterday. John Arena from Dallas. Good morning, Mr. 2230. Jonathan from Denver, Colorado. I love Denver, Colorado, by the way. I just taught a class here a couple months ago. Akeen, good morning. Akeen is one of our regulars and a coin member as well. Juicy, J-U-S-S-I. That's an interesting from Turku, Finland. Man, I need to come to Finland to teach a class. I, I love that place. Actually, I've never been there, but I love what it looks like. Matthias is from Germany. We got Finland in the house. We got Germany in the house. Good morning, Sheila from Mississippi. Outstanding. Hey, Rich Alloway, I haven't heard from you for a long time, man. How are you? Good morning, Wade Osberg. Good morning, good morning. Navin Dionif from New York. Wow, we have a lot of people on. If I miss you, Chris Berry, good morning. I think I said hi. Tracy S. Stefanski. Is that right, Tracy? Right. Randy D., good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, all right. All right. So we got a lot of people on. So let, let's talk about this just a little bit. And then here, here in a second. So, um, folks, as a reminder, and I know Chris is looking at the comments, so she may repost a question. But if you post a question during the live stream and I don't answer your question, please just repost it. Just throw it back up in the comments. Nobody's going to get irritated and I might miss your question. And we'll do a lot of Q&A toward the end of this. Um, I do want you to do me a favor right now, though. We just hit 94 a second ago. Do me a favor and stop if you have the ability on your Facebook page. Go to share, click the share, go to other options, select a group. And then if you're a member of some of these big groups out there that, uh, you know, maybe you're a member of uh, the Surefire Institute group or the Phoenix Flashlight group, which I will be showing off one of the Phoenix lights they just gave me that they would, by the way, this bad boy is super bright. I'm pretty impressed. I haven't used these a lot, but I've been pretty impressed so far with what I've seen. Uh, but whatever you're you're a member of, whatever group, please do me a favor, share or share it to your wall, or send a group text. Just group your group text your friends. Say, hey, we're on Facebook Live. Jump on and say hi to Mr. Mike Seaclander, and we're gonna get going. I would love to see. I see a hello from Thailand. Good morning, Thailand. Jesse's on this morning as well. I would love to see us break 150 this morning. We hit 100 and probably 15 or 20 last Thursday. Uh, right now, it seems or it seems to be leaning toward Wednesday being a more popular live stream day. But I'm I'm looking at that. So do me a favor, click share. I'll say that a few more times. I know Chris will mention that as well. Please click share. That's the only way I get eyes on this free live stream. Okay, so let's talk let's talk about low light stuff. So uh, by the way, a couple of the lights that I'm going to show off today. I have a few different lights. I've got a little Streamlight MicroStream. Used to be one of my carry flashlights. These are great little teeny tiny lights that are super easy to carry in business type pants or whatever else that are very, very low profile. I really like them. And by the way, I'm not sponsored by a flashlight company, but most of these flashlights were given to me by the various companies. Um, if you want to pay me like $18 million and sponsor me, you can, but it would probably take that much because I like all kinds of lights and I want to be able to own almost everything. Just kidding. Not 18 million. This is a Streamlight ProTac 1L. This one is actually set up for use in IDPA. And I'll show you how I use this in a second and why I have this washer. I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, my buddy Walt and, and his son gave me this tip a long time ago in an IDPA match. This is a Surefire Stiletto. They make this in a metal and a plastic version. Probably one of my favorite carrier lights. I absolutely love the low flat profile. It also has a, a momentary button where you can turn on momentary three different uh, variations and an end cap activation. On a good carrier light, you have to have end cap activation. So I can do a momentary or permanent activation with my thumb. Uh, it's a good size to strike with, but it's also small enough where when it's in my hand, I can manipulate the slide. And this is, of course, one of the Phoenix. This is the Phoenix PD32. This is probably slightly big to carry in my pocket full time, but this would be a really great truck light or, or uh, you know, nightstand light to grab in the middle of the night. And my rule is carry lights are nice and small and compact, 
you know, my truck lights or nightstand lights are going to be bigger, robust. This bad boy is huge in terms of lumens, okay? So there's some lights I'm going to show off today. So let's, let's talk real quickly about the low light system. I said your low light system has to have three different things that it can do for you. Number one, it has to give you the ability to search. So let me talk to you about the principles of how I search. So number one, gun position first. Let me talk to you about gun position. Gun position is going to be compressed in some manner, right? I'm not going to have the gun out here as I'm searching. I don't want to say, hey, bad guy in the dark, grab my gun. I don't want to do that. I want to have the gun compressed back here in a position where I can use my light and I can search. Uh, I can do different things. Now, let me talk to you how I think you should consider searching. And when we talk about technique, I'll show you the shooting positions. And I, I, will, I will open your eyes to what the light may do in terms of being dangerous. So number one, in terms of searching, don't backlight yourself. So don't turn a light on in a room and then walk into the doorway with the light behind you. It's called backlighting. So be aware of being backlit in a room. You can also be backlit from a window. So if that window to my right over there is very, very bright and I'm in a room and I'm in front of that window, I'm going to be backlit. I'm going to be very easy to see or, or find. Okay, I'm going to be a big target, so don't backlight. Make sure you have darkness behind you. If you have light behind you, that's called being backlit, so don't be backlit. Okay. Uh, number two, search and move. So when I walk into a room, assuming I have no idea what the threat is, but I think there might be a threat in that room, I'm going to do a quick wash of my light, then the light's going to go off, and I'm going to move. Now, notice when I move, I'm being like sneaky, like a cat. Right. This is pre-locating the threat or the possibility of a threat. You think there might be someone in your barn or your house. You made the decision to leave your secure space. I'm not saying that's the right answer, but you're searching. So once again, I will wash the light in the room and I will typically move. Right. I'll be moving down the wall. I won't be on the wall, but I'll be moving down the wall. OK, um, so I'm, I'm searching and I'm moving. OK, I'm moving my position. So in theory, if I illuminate and someone sees that and reacts to the light, I'm hoping I am not in the same position that I was when I did my initial illumination of the light. Now, there's no guarantees, right? Because if you do this in your dark house and you play with this and you light up the room, you're going to realize if you put, you know, family member, have them play the bad guy, of course, with safe gun, red guns, no real guns, none of that real life stuff. Do it safe. They know where you are right away. But I will tell you that someone in a room, if they see this, right, that that flash of the light will typically cause them to do this in blind, and they they don't know exactly what, where you are. They believe you're still there, but in reality, you're here, right? Now, in the search uh, phase, the search phase is also a phase where I may do stuff like this. I may illuminate an area in a room and have the light away from my body. I will not shoot like this. I will shoot by indexing the light up near my eye. We'll talk about the pros and cons of having the light near your body in a second. But I will use other tactics to keep the light away from my body. So there you go. Illuminate and move. And then for a second, look and listen, right? Now, what happens if during my illumination, I see a threat? So if you can imagine the camera, you are the threat. Well, what do I do? Well, the second I illuminate and find that threat, I immediately put the light in the, the eyes. So your rule number two in terms of your search phase is if you find someone, light their eyes up. Do you, I'm not sure if you could tell, but the camera shuts down. When I do a low light demo or do a low light class, what I do is we'll, we'll wait till it's dusk or we'll turn the lights down in the room. And then I'll have a student, I'll walk up and say, let's, let's do a little low light test in terms of the, de the, the decision cycle, right? The decision speed cycle. And I'll say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold up my hand and I have a student flick my hand, right? So they're flicking my hand. I'm holding up my hand. I'm giving them different targets and they're flicking my hand. And then I do this and I hold up my hand and they go, boom. So about four seconds later, they have the ability to see again and flick my hand. That's the point. So when you come in, when you're in your search phase and you walk into that room and you wash the light in the room and you find a threat, that moment in time, I want the light in their eyes. And I would tell you to keep the light in their eyes for as long as you need, because that moment in time, now they are reacting to the light. They can't see you've taken their vision away. And even if their intent is to shoot you, you'd be surprised at how that momentary flash of light shuts the brain down for three or four seconds, which would give you the time to shoot, right? To shoot or to potentially move offline and say, hey, 
who are you in my living room? Show me your hands, whatever you're going to say, right? It, it, so it does a lot of really good things. It gives us the ability to momentarily stop the reaction process of the threat. It gives us the ability to identify if it is a threat. And then three, if we make the decision to actually shoot, we can shoot. Okay, so in your search phase, I'll summarize with this. Walk in the room, right, or in the room. Wash the light, move. Wash the light, move. If you find a threat, wash the light, illuminate the threat, and make your decision. Is this a threat? Do I need to engage, or do I need to communicate, or do I need to go to a better position in another room? Maybe take a position to cover or whatever else, okay? So that is the search phase of the low light system. By the way, we got 80 live viewers on. I think this is actually good material for most of you, but I'm surprised we haven't broke 100. What's up with that? All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, Kip. Hey, Gilly, Gail. Good morning. Keith was, man, from Phil's, from Philippines, maybe? I'm not sure. All right, so... Let me see what kind of comments I have here. What do we have here? What do we have here? What is the deal with my mouse? My mouse is going crazy here. All right. I don't see any comments popping up. So let's talk about, hey, good morning, Monk from North Carolina. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay. So we talked about the search phase. Let's talk about the combatives area, right? Three things your low light system, have, system gives you. The ability to search effectively, not combatives. So for me, I like a pretty robust handheld flashlight with a, a thumb activated button so I could activate the light. This also gives me a little bit of uh, the flashlight hanging out of the edge of my hand. So now I can strike. So what kind of strikes can I do with this light? Well, can I punch with it? Yes, I can absolutely punch with it, right? Um, can I throw a hammer type strike? Yes, I can. Uh, can I pull an arm? You know, if, if someone is, is, is trying to throw or reach or grab a hold of my shirt, you know, I could take my, my light, I could hook that arm, and I could pull the arm, okay, and move my body. And then last but not least, you know, I can go to a defensive position. So we're talking about a defensive position. The half cage is simply where we're taking our form and we're making contact with our head. Now, I understand the other part of my head is exposed, which is why I'm going to turn my body a little bit, and this is like I said earlier, only a momentary transition from me defending my head in a half cage or what I call a high cage or a low cage. And there are three different versions of this. I might use a high cage if I sensed or felt someone coming from the top. I want to protect the top of my head from someone swinging a stick down at my head. Uh, you, you could probably say, well, this will probably stop an edge weapon or a blade coming in this direction as well. Understand, we're not going to stay there long. If I'm doing a high type cage position, notice where my gun is. My gun is in a position where I'm immediately going to have the ability to start engaging and hitting the lower center line of the body. The low position for the firearm, by the way, is designed to target the pelvis and the lower body down here. And you might say, well, Mike, why would you have a low angle, right, versus an upper angle? A lot of folks talk about the rock and lock position for close quarters. Well, if you can imagine where am I pointing my gun, and if my arm is out here striking the bad guy, okay, or caging, notice the muzzle in the hand is getting too close. I'm not even going to throw my hand fully out there because if the, the gun was pointed, right, in this direction, and I go to strike, where am I pointing the gun? So in my close quarters, I'm going to have a retracted firearm position. So I could be caging, boom, 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 and shooting the entire time, okay? Um, so this might be from more of an attack that's coming from the top of my head. I'm making contact with my arm. And there's some times where I'll lower the arm, and I'll literally have my eyes just above my elbow, right? So I'm still protecting my face, but I can see things. And by the way, with both of these positions, I can still illuminate with the flashlight, okay? Don't forget, once again, your reminder, these are transitions to the point where I can strike or shoot or move or something else, okay? So those, those are your combative possibilities with the flashlight, okay? Let me make sure I don't have any questions popping up here. Man, I do not know what is up with my doggone mouse. I can't seem to scroll. Um... So, John, uh, maybe it depends on 
the ability to have a thumb safety. John, I think I see your comment about a thumb safety, but man, I'd love it if you give me more details on that because I'm not sure what that means exactly. Sorry, as I'm trying to fix my mouse, I'm about to smash it up against the wall. Have a little fade on, fit on Facebook Live here. I don't know why my mouse won't work. I do not know. It's, oh, there it goes. Okay. Uh, let me scroll back here. What do we have here, here, here? Yeah. I don't see. Do you flag your thumb with the patrol? And it's, so, uh, John, you're, the question, John's question is, in terms of the thumb position, He's calling this the pectoral pectoral index position. That's a term that you might hear from South Mark, Mr. Craig Douglas, who's an outstanding individual and teaches a lot of close quarter stuff. Really, really good instructor. When we're talking about the thumb position, they will typically have the thumb flag up in a position where with a striker fired system, the thumb creates a small gap or offset between the gun and your body so the slide can travel freely. Uh, as you know, John, I'm going to be shooting with my thumb on top of the thumb safety, right? So that thumb safety position as the thumb rolls out is naturally giving me that slight offset. I am not, uh, folks, in terms of John's question, I'm not doing this. I will tell you this makes the gun a lot easier to grab and take away from you. I'm pushing the gun up against my body, but there is still plenty of space for the slide to be traveling as I'm shooting from that position. So, yes, hopefully that answers your question. Hey, Carlos from Panama. I just saw Carlos jump off from Panama. That's crazy, right? Um, oh, Akeem. Yeah, Akeem's question. You didn't mention muzzle, mention muzzle strikes. I, I So let's let's talk about that. When I'm in this low light system and I maybe need to strike, right, C could I effectively throw a muzzle strike as well? Yes. You may say, well, Mike, why would you ever throw a muzzle strike? Well, uh, maybe you got into the foot, the fouled up tangle, and your gun malfunctioned. Okay. And the, now you're fighting, right? So I want to use the sucker as a hammer initially until I have the chance to clear it maybe with one hand and shoot, right? Uh, maybe you're fighting someone and you don't know where your family member is. Maybe you're trying to get your daughter out of the, out of the room. You know there's a threat. There's something bad going on. It's a parking lot. And the next thing you know, you are in a fight. And this guy is rocking and rolling, and you're counter-striking, and you really want to pull that trigger and, and shoot, but you, you can't, and his head is right there. Could I throw a muzzle strike? Absolutely. Um, one of the interesting things about muzzle strikes, I wrote an article for PDN a long time ago, and a lot of folks will, will assume the gun's going to go off when you make impact with the muzzle. It doesn't happen, even if you pull the trigger, because the, the time you make that contact, it actually pushes the slide slightly out of battery, and the gun will fire, Okay. Uh, and believe it or not, every time you strike with the muzzle and the, the muzzle comes out of battery, it returns to battery because that's what the recoil spring is designed to do. So every time I practiced or tested muzzle striking, I could throw a hard muzzle strike and the gun wouldn't go off and the slide would return to battery and I could actually fire from that position. So absolutely, you could use muzzle strikes. OK, um, so let's let's talk about the flashlight shooting position now and then we'll do some Q&A and wrap it up. By the way, we didn't I don't know if we hit 100 this morning or not have to admit, Thursday mornings aren't quite as popular as Wednesday mornings. I don't know why that is, especially being live on three Facebook pages. Who knows? Um, all right. I don't see any more questions so far. Okay. So we talked about searching, move, right? We talked about combative, striking, defending the head, cage positions, right? Let's talk about shooting. So I get into position. I find a threat. I illuminate the eyes. Remember, keep the light in their eyes. That's your key point. And then if I need to shoot, I'm going to transition to what I call the one-handed eye index technique. Now, I'm going to summarize this very, very quickly. So let me put this uh, out there. Let, let's, let's, uh, let's quell an argument and um, give me something I can chop up and put on Instagram to, 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 to put out for all the naysayers. When you look at this position, okay, the first comment I'm going to get on Facebook, and actually um, – I, had a, I saw a buddy on Facebook the other day, very popular blog. You, uh, uh, it talked about how folks poo-poo on positions that have the light near your body or your head. And the, the comment that I will get on Facebook, so let's call this right away. Is, well, Mike, the light is right next to your head. They will shoot at the light. Yes, they, they probably will shoot at the light. But if you're shooting your firearm at them, it's making noise, a lot of noise, and it's creating light as well. They already know exactly where you are. 
understand we transition from the search technique where we're trying to be sneaky and find them to the engage technique where I took their mom, their brain, I turned their brain off for a moment at time, boom, 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 boom. And I'm hopefully I'm firing before they have the time to react. And here's the interesting thing. If you look at every single technique we talk about in low light, whether it's the eye index, a lot of folks call this the cheek or the neck index. And I'll tell you why I don't like the cheek or neck index. But whether it's eye index technique or the old Harry's technique, look where the light is, right? It's near my face or my body. Uh, or the Roger Surefire technique where it's a modified grip or any variant, the light is always going to be center line near your body. Okay, almost every technique we teach out there is near your body. The only one I'm familiar with that doesn't, right, is the FBI technique where, and I've, I've heard this comes from days where they were carrying a different land, lantern. They weren't doing this. But this, I will tell you, when you try this in low light, it's really different, uh, difficult to pull off. You don't illuminate your sights at all. It's just not a great technique. And I would tell you, once again, the person knows where you are. So I want to boom, 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 dominate them with my light and have an effective aiming position and indexing position. So there you go. There you have it. Yes, the light is near my head. I'm going from searching and sneaking, boom, to engaging very, very quickly. And that's why I do that. Okay. By the way, people that are poo-pooing on lights next to your face will be like, but here's my new weapon mount of light on my modified Glock, salient, whatever. Guess where the light is when you have a weapon mount of light on a handgun? It's, guess what? It's right there near your face. Just wanted to throw that out there, okay? So techniques, and we'll, we'll talk about this here in a second. Why do I use a high position, what I've named the eye index technique? Well, first of all, it, it gives me an indicator of once the light is up near my head, right? I can move my head around. I don't search like this. You already know that because I taught the search phase earlier in this video. But it, it does allow me, if the person was moving, to be looking. And everywhere I look, the light goes. Okay. Number two, I'm going to turn around a little bit. And this is why I do not use, give you a little tip here. This is why I don't use a chin or a neck index. If you look at the shadow of the gun, okay, with a low light position, the shadow, right, will cover up the threat. So if that shadow is covering up the threat, I can't see their hands as effectively. I can't engage and I can't aim. Number two, my uh, sights are not lit up. Like I can't really see my sights very clearly. Now if I slide my light up here, the shadow drops away and I illuminate my sights very brightly. So if the light is in the right position, the shadow drops out of the way so I can see better and it illuminates my sights so I can actually aim better as well. So if you're using a one-handed position, you know, and by the way, IDPA competitors, I compete with this position if the targets are not super hard to hit. So if the targets don't offer a ton of difficulty, I'll one-hand them, and I will use the INX technique, you boom, 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 and then I can load and do all the things I need to with these two fingers, okay? You may say, well, Mike, well, why, don't, why aren't you searching and engaging with the Harry's technique, right? Remember, my low-light system has to give me three things at all times. The ability to search, the ability to defend my head and throw strikes, and the ability to shoot. So can I search with the Harry's technique? Yes, I can, right? Can I defend my head effectively if all of a sudden you, the camera, are the threat? Well, I could probably do this, right? But in order for me to throw a strike or get my hand up near my head, I'm going to have to cover my arm with my muzzle. I'm not even going to do that on the live stream, right? So I don't like the hands being tied up in any of these positions. Um, the, you know, back in the day, the, the Rogers technique with the button activated light, it's hard to do with this one, was this, where he basically modified his grip and then he could squeeze and activate the light with the palm of his hand, right? The other pro the problem I have, once again, can I search with the light like this? Can I do my, can I search? Sure, I can. Can I defend my head? If you walked around a corner and tried to punch me in the face, what do I have to do to defend myself? Well, you may say, well, Mike, you, you can shoot. Sure, I can, I can shoot, assuming that I get a shot off and it has that much effect right away. But I don't really have the ability to push you away from me uh, for a moment in time and defend my head, right? So that's the problem I have with this technique. You know, or, you know, um, Julie Golub, I believe, used to use a modified grip technique like this where she put her hands together. Sure, can you search? In this case, I might buy this a little bit better, right? 
um, because you could you could still throw the a, a strike. But but notice when I do this, I've got to move the gun to a different position. And for me, this doesn't offer any additional gripping power. I don't get much out of it. Where I when I search, I can retract the handgun. I can protect it. I can search. I can engage. I can strike. That's why I do what I do. Okay, if that makes any sense to you. Um, so that's the flashlight technique that I recommend. And if you're playing with this, take the flashlight and get it into a position where with a good one-handed grip, the, the actual light illuminates the sights and doesn't shadow the target, right? Now, if you're practicing this live fire, you could consider doing little things like, you know, engaging and then working on your scan techniques and stuff like that. All the same things we would do in a defensive handgun type training class or whatever, but, you know, think about how you would use a flashlight. Um, one, a couple more tips for you. When I'm doing a one-handed position, I always have the light in my hand where I can activate it. I can do things, but I can also, I can also tap. I can rack. I can do the things that I need to with my fingers. If I needed to, I can reach down and grab a new magazine. I can insert it in the gun. I can load the gun, right? I can clear my functions. So I can still manipulate the handgun and do things if I need to. But once again, I can very easily shoot from that position, okay? Um, so Rich said, I've heard the bad guy could pull low left when shooting at the right. Assuming they're a right-handed shooter, Rich, I hope they do pull low right or low left or whatever else. They're probably going to be right-handed, um, and maybe they'll miss. I'm hoping they'll miss because I'm, you know, the whole thing for me in low light is, Find a search method that hopefully puts you in a position where once you illuminate the room, you're not there. When you find the threat, momentarily paralyze them with the light. And if it's a threat, engage them as quickly as possible and solve the problem shooting if you have to shoot, if you made that decision to search. So that's how I, I look at the whole thing. Um, I'm not a fan of a lot of other techniques, although in the search phase, I might do funky stuff like hold the light over here and illuminate it and you know i might pop around the corner of a door i will tell you that i will use the hairy technique if i have the edge of a wall and i'm i'm slicing the pie and trying to get around cover and the reason i do that is that puts the light past the edge of the wall that's the only reason i do that technique the other alternative because if i have the light here and imagine the edge of the wall is right here the light is going to flash into the wall and back into my face so there are times when, when i may actually switch my light up to the other side of my head which is a possibility as well. You got to practice that. That's kind of a, a weird position itself. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can scroll down for Q and A and questions. Hallways, the tunnel of death. Tony, you are exactly right about that way. Stay out of hallways. They're dangerous, but hey, they exist, right? Um, Gilly, love the eye index. Very hateful. Sandra, thank you. You're welcome, Sandra. Craig, if you have time, can you show the IDP a bit? Oh, yes, Craig. Let's talk about that right now, man. So the reason I'm, I have this set up is I said in, in an IDPA stage, here's your competitive tip. Uh, I will probably one hand them unless the tar target difficulty is, is really hard. So if there's a bunch of non-threats and they, these are really hard shots that are a little harder for me to shoot with one hand, where I'm like, okay, I really need two hands. I would like to have a two-handed grip. I will switch to my El Trico, right? So this is a modified flashlight. The end button is the activation button itself. There's a little piece of tape on the flashlight and a kind of a rubber grommet here. So I will set the flashlight up in my hand. So I can still reach down. I can sweep the vest with my fingers. I can grab magazines and do loads if I need to, right? But what I'll do on the stage is the second the timer goes off, I'll turn the light on and I'll leave it on. And then I'm going to take my, my hand, turn the light back off for you. And this is the grip I'm going to form, right? So I'm going to be real careful that I don't knock the flashlight up against the mag release, right? And I'm taking my thumb and I'm pushing down on the light. So I push down on the light. It actually orients the light straight up, right? So now I have really, really good illumination of the sights, right? So I can see the sights very good, but I can shoot, right? I can pull the trigger. I can do all things, but I still have a pretty full grip on the handgun itself, right? So I have a, a stabilized shooting position. You can roll your hand out a little bit if you want to, you know, play with that. I can actually fire those shots, right? Boom, 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 right? And then that's my shooting position. So that is that is my IDPA shooting position. I know some folks will do this as well, right? Um, I don't know how they do that. Or I know some guys that actually do it with the pinky. But for me, when you start to get lower in your fingers, 
now the light points down. I want the light to point as, as straightforward as possible because it illuminates the targets a lot better. And I'm I'm using the palm of my hand. Craig, you've seen this discussion. I think you remember. I'm still taking the palm of my hand and pushing the back of the gun. I don't care as much about these three fingers. They're just hooking my hand, but I'm using that palm to drive in right for stabilization. Boom, 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 boom. So if you look at the light, see how the light is right where my sights are? So there you go. There's my secret IDPA shooting technique. Um, so Rich, um, as far as the rubber bands, I think if you're asking about this, this simply allows um, a solid position in my hand. It's a rubber grommet that doesn't move. And I took, this is a, this is like a piece of a hose. And then I wrap some tape around it. I just don't want it to move. So I can pull it into my hand, right? Uh, and I'm not activated by using the palm. I, I turn it on. Because I don't want to have the light go on and off by hitting the palm of my hand. So, Rich, I hope I answered your question there. So, okay. Uh, handheld light. That's a great question. So, Alan's question is one I get all the time. Um, so, let's talk about this. The utility of a handheld light when you have a weapon-mounted light. This is a difficult question for me to answer. And the reason it's difficult is because I, I would not be necessarily a, a proponent of covering people with your light. But I would tell you if you have a, this is not a grip activated weapon mounted light, which is my preference. But if you have a weapon mounted light, you're giving up the advantage of having it at all, right? If you're using a handheld light to search. Um, so if I grab my, my gun from my safe that has a weapon mounted light, all my home defense guns do. Uh, I may use this to search, but on, to, 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 to put it bluntly and honestly, I would probably search with the light. I would turn the light on and off, right? I'm washing the light into the room, right? If I found a threat, yes, I may I may point the gun at the person, right, until I identify them. Um, I know, I'm going to know right away if it's a family member. Of course, I'm not going to do that. I do accept the fact that the muzzle direction is in the direction that the light is. Uh, but I'm using good trigger finger to discipline and everything else, you know, probably good safety discipline on, on an IT-11 to mitigate that. I'm confident with my skills. Am I telling you I think you should point your weapon of light and search with it the entire time? Maybe not so much, but I will tell you that if you're if you're doing a lot of this, that you got a weapon of light, right? And then, so, so what am I going to do? Shoot with one hand or search, and then I find the thread and drop the light, turn the weapon of light on, and and utilize it. So I think that would be kind of stupid. I think if you're going to utilize a weapon amount of light, you should probably search with it. You should have great trigger finger discipline and you should have the ability to also shoot from other positions. I'm actually going to use the weapon amount of light probably as my search light. I'm not going to tell you that I would poo-poo on you if you wanted to use a handheld light. But once again, boom, this goes to a shooting situation. What are you going to do? Well, in this case, why have a weapon amount of light? I guess technically I could I could dual light it, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, by the way, I hope that answers your question, Alan. One more thing about those of you, I, I did want to talk to you about uh, optics. So if you are, if you're carry gun, if you're if you're one of those folks that is, is shooting optic, here's a tip for you. You you've got to practice illuminating through the window of your optic and on the wall and see if your optic is still visible. Uh, if you're using an optic that has an auto adjustment feature where it, it adjusts the illumination or the intensity of the optic reticle up or down, I would turn it off and turn it to a manual setting. So I'm going to use a manual setting on the optic. In this particular case, you know, I can see the optic clearly, the reticle still there, and I'm washing all of the light right into the window itself. So play with that a little bit. Put the light on the wall, you know, look through the optic and make sure you can still see the reticle, turn it to a manual setting. Okay. Um, uh, that's a good question. So William, great question. Do I use a lanyard or a wrap or just a rubber grommet? So my full-time carry light does not have a, a wrap or strap because it's in my pocket. Um, it's also my utility light. So no, I'm, I'm just going to hold it in my hand, but I have the ability because I leave this much space open so I can manipulate the sliding clear malfunctions and, and whatever else. Okay. 
Uh, Martin, what kind of holster and belt for competition shooting? Go to precisionholsters.com. They're also one of the show sponsors. And check them out. You can't beat Precision Holsters. And they have a, um, a Seaclander competition line, by the way. Okay. Uh, Alan, hopefully I answered your question. Uh, Chris talked about the modification. Scott, great info. Thank you for watching. All right. Yeah, Tim, good question. The old IDPA rules are not allowed a lanyard to be used. I don't know. We'd have to check on that. I, I'm not going to state the IDPA rule book. Uh, I do believe you're correct that the old rules did allow that a lanyard to be used during reloads or whatever else. But to be honest with you, if I'm doing that kind of stuff, I'm mimicking, like if I'm doing one-handed techniques, um, I practice having the light in a position where I can reach back, I can grab a new magazine, I can insert it, right, and I can load my gun all with the same technical position of my hand. And I'm using my little secret cheater IDPA technique. I can do the same thing because these fingers are still open. So I can, I can reach up. I can sweep my vest open. I can grab a magazine. I can insert it, right? I can back the slide. You know, I can go right back to the positions that I need to. Um, you know, once I'm, I'm done, I can, I can fire with the same technique. So I will use my hand to manipulate the magazines and stuff like that. Okay. All right, folks. All right, that's all I have. It's uh, 821. We had a great show in this morning, almost 100 live viewers. Um, I'm going to have to figure out if we're going to go back to Wednesday mornings or Thursday mornings. Sometimes it's dictated by my schedule, but either way, once again, like I said in the front part of the show, um, I sure appreciate the almost 100 live viewers that took the time to get on and hopefully learn some things about low light. Low light is one of those you know, it's one of those things that everybody seems to have an opinion and an idea on. A lot of those folks that jump on social media haven't done a lot of shooting and training in the low light. So that's the first thing that I would recommend if you're wondering about some of the techniques that I talked about is get your flashlight out, get a plastic safe gun, you know, a red gun and a non-firing demonstration piece and work on clearing your house. And then if you have the ability to amp it up safely, put a thread in the house and give them like a foam baseball bat and tell them if they see or they can sneak up on you, they can knock you in the head or they can reach up and try to grab your, your gun or whatever else. And you'll quickly learn about gun position. You'll learn a lot about light position. You'll learn to, to throw strikes and defend your head. You'll learn that a low light system has to offer the three things that I said at the beginning of this live stream. It has to give you the ability to search. It has to give you the ability to fight. And it has to give you the ability to boom shoot, you know, with whatever technique you choose. So don't, don't, um, don't forget about the environment that you're actually fighting in because I think that's critically important. Okay, folks. Hey, um, that's all I have. Chris says, keep it to Thursday. I'm getting a bunch of thanks and, and everything else. Thank you all for watching. Do me a favor when you're, when we're done, when this live stream ends, you can go to the, uh, the sheet performance or, uh, pages, IDP pages, go to videos. So you can select the video and you can share the video. Do me a favor, after we're done and I'm off the line, I'll live stream, share it. I believe Chris will post this in the IDPA Facebook page. If not, you can check that out. I do have a low light set of videos out there. It's called the Low Light Fight System. Uh, the book's pretty good. I know there's a couple of spelling errors in it. I'm working on that. We're doing an edit on that. But that's all I have. And, uh, folks, that's all I have. Um, Jesse, would a Bob XL be useful in practicing light strikes? You are 100% correct, Jesse. Yes, that's what I work on my striking stuff. Matter of fact, in the combative section of the low light fight, and Jesse, you have full access to that because you're a coin member, we talk about all that. So, yes, Bob XL is an excellent product as well. All right, that's all I have, folks. Get out and practice. Search your home. Put some of these things into context, and you'll probably will come to some of the same conclusions that I have. Have a great Thursday night, great weekend, and until then, train hard.